Good morning, ladies. It's so good to see you. Hi, you guys made it through the busyness. You got here. And what a blessing Blake's worship is. Thank you, Blake. All right. I love hearing you guys love each other. It's such a blessing. Um, if I've never met you, I'm Lisa. I've been doing Radiance for a lot of years, and it's a blessing. So I don't know about you guys, but, like, one of my favorite things in the world is to take a road trip. I love it. I love driving. I love seeing things. I have a wonderful husband. He doesn't mind. We can stop at the rest stop. No big deal. We can stop and get out. Oh, Vista Point, let's go. You need a soda? Let's stop. It's wonderful. I have traveled with other people. <coughs> My bad. Who was, no, we don't stop. We're on our way. We're going from here to there, and we are not stopping. Well, ladies, I'm so sorry to say today we are not stopping. We are going through James from the start to the end. We're going on a quick road trip, and we're going to look out the window, and we're going to see what we're going to be seeing in depth when the other people are teaching, and you get to stop and look and walk around and really absorb. But today, it's from here to there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Lord, that you desire to do so much in us and through us and that you have a plan and a purpose for each of our lives just exactly where you've put us. Lord, even in the circumstances we face, even when they're difficult, even when they're hard, even when they're painful, you are working through those for your glory and for our good. Lord, we pray now that you would come, that you would be among us, that you would touch our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each one of us. Lord, we pray that you would just make your word come to life and change our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So many of us have talents, skills, occupations that few others may ever be aware of. We have acquired knowledge and abilities that only affect those in direct contact with us. For instance, as you guys know, I work within the world of radiology, where the use of x-ray energy to produce medical images that aid in the diagnosis and treatment of illness and injury is the focus of my attention 40 plus hours a week. I speak at work in terms of kilovoltage potential, milliamperage, patient body habitus, and su suspected pathology. The goal I aim for is to produce what we refer to as an optimal image, one that faithfully demonstrates the reality of the physical body it represents. So, like this. Now, I am told this looks like a guitar, <laughs> but this is, in fact, not a guitar. And, in fact, it's actually not even a real person. This is um, x-ray I took in school of a what we call a phantom, which is made of plastic and all sorts of stuff to imitate the human body. But this is actually the bottom of the lumbar spine to the sacrum to the pelvis to the hips. That is a gorgeous image. It reproduces exactly what the reality is. The next one is actually a real person. This is what happens if you step on a tire tool. It is not good. It went right through the shoe and through the top of the, the foot and through the top of the foot. It faithfully represents the reality of what was true with that patient. Now, if your x-ray, for any reason, doesn't represent reality truthfully, then it is referred to as the dreaded suboptimal image. The radiologist does not like it. And if it doesn't bear any reality or any 
referring to reality, it doesn't let them detect the condition at all, then it is called the non-diagnostic image, one of no value whatsoever, and you will hear about it, but we don't do that. We don't do that. That was, again, a lab image. In James, we're going to enter a different world. We're going to enter the world of faith in action. We see that the normal or optimal Christian life that is entered initially by faith in Christ is progressively lived out in the lives of believers. Without the perfect work of Christ, there could be no perfecting of believers. True? No one can walk with God who has not first been restored to God. We must first have forgiveness of sins. We must have justification. We must have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. These are our indispensable foundation. However, once we have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, then his desire is that we take on the likeness of Jesus, that we bear his image. And just as a dedicated radiographer seeks to produce an optimal image, the Lord wants us to be optimal images of Jesus. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. One might say the proof of our faith that it's real is a changed life. It's one that shows we're becoming increasingly like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So James addresses various aspects of this transformation as he encourages us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. We'll find that he writes with an urgency and an emphasis that leave us little doubt as to the way our beliefs should impact our lives. In considering the frank and sometimes pointed admonishment found throughout this letter, we must always realize and remember that all scripture is given to us by inspiration from God, and it's useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what is wrong in our life. It straightens us out. It helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well-prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. We need to look to the heart of our Heavenly Father, who's working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So today I'm going to be reading, it's kind of a change for me, you guys know I'm a New King James Version kind of girl, but today I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. And the reason is that while it's not the best Bible perhaps to use for your study, because it translates entire thoughts rather than each word, it's a real quick read and it's a little bit easier to understand. So let's quickly read over what the Lord inspired James to write and listen and consider as though it had my name, as though it had your name in the address. So starting in chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Jewish Christians scattered everywhere, and to the ladies at Calvary Chapel High Desert Radiance, greetings. The author of this letter is believed to be James, a half-brother of Jesus. He had not always believed Jesus was Lord and Messiah, but after Jesus appeared to him shortly after his resurrection, we can find James praying with the Lord's disciples. And now, as he writes to his fellow believers, he does not identify himself as James, Jesus' half-brother, but as James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He emphasized not his earthly relationship with Jesus, but his spiritual one. He had become a voluntary slave, one who belonged body and soul to Jesus. He had become an important leader of the church in Jerusalem, and he addressed this correspondence to those who may very well once have been part of his congregation, people he knew, just like you know the people here. But they had been scattered out throughout the Roman Empire by the persecution that had come upon the church. Because these early believers did not have the support of an established church where they were, James wrote to encourage them and to instruct them so they would grow and mature in their life of faith. 
His letter is thought to be one of the first books, if not the first book, of the New Testament, and they think it was written somewhere in A.D. 45 to 49. You know what? It had not been that long since Jesus had been resurrected and ascended into heaven. They think about 15 years. So in these years, persecution, as we said, became widespread. And historians tell us that just 13 years after writing this letter, James would be put to death for his faith. Considering all that he was seeing and experiencing, it is no wonder that he writes with such sharp forthrightness As inspired by the Holy Spirit, he offers warnings and exhortations that call believers to live what they believe. So in what ways does he want us to do this? Well, one is by teaching us to endure trials and temptations that test our faith. See chapter 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. They're unstable in everything they do. But believers who are poor, they actually have something to boast about. For God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes when our own desires which entice us and drive us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my brothers and sisters. Whatever good and perfect gift, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word And we, out of all creation, are his prized possession. We can't really know the depth of our character, the depth of our faith, until we see how we react under pressure. The Lord will use conflict, troubles, suffering, persecution, and any other adversity as a tool to refine and to purify our faith. Zechariah 13.9 says, I will bring them through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. Don't those things make us cry out to the Lord? And I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. It's not because you're not one of God's children that you suffer. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. George Boddy had this insight. See Jesus as the refiner, watching with the greatest earnestness the purifying of your soul in the furnace of earth. His hand has lighted the fire, which is now separating the pure metal of holiness from the dross of sin in you. His loving eye is ever eagerly watching for the moment when the purifying work is done. Then, without a moment's delay, he withdraws the fire and the purified soul is removed from the furnace. See when it is that the purification is completed. It is when the image of Christ is reflected in us so that he can see himself in us as in a mirror. We call this process sanctification. The Rebel Bible Dictionary defines it this way. Through Jesus, 
ordinary human beings are set apart to serve God in their daily lives. That's you. Christ, alive in his people in every situation, enables believers to glorify God by living their lives in a Christ-like way. Let's consider that in light of James, starting again in verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, easier said than done, slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be righteous but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So what we believe about God and our Lord Jesus Christ should result in change in our lives. It can be a struggle. But as we rely on the Spirit of God and obey the word which God has spoken, the Lord will help us become that kind of person he wants each of us to be. We must hear and do. I'm not going to change my appearance just by looking in the mirror and walking away, am I? I have to do something about what I see. I have to wash my face. I have to brush my teeth. I have to get the egg out of there. You're not going to want to look at me if I've got yuck in my teeth. I have to brush my unruly hair, or else there's been no value to looking in the mirror, right? No point. Why look in the mirror if you're not going to do something about what you see? Well, when we read the Bible, when we work on our study, it should have an effect on our attitudes, our words, and our speech. Ephesians 5, 25 and 20 through 27 tells us, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor. This is for the church. He wants to present you in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing so that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, in x-ray, A blemish on the film is referred to as an artifact. It is not a good thing. These defects mar the image, and they keep those from looking at it, from seeing what they need to see. I wonder if I can hold this up. They can't see it over there. This is an actual x-ray, and for some reason or another, it took on words of the folder it was kept in. So unfortunately, where there should be, you should be able to see there's a broken hip, you can't see a thing. You can see the words nuke med really good, and that's about it. That is an artifact. That is a blemish. That keeps people from seeing what should they should be able to see, right? Well, in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, James turns our attention to a big blemish that can spot the church and keep people from seeing Jesus, and that's the sin of partiality. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed. It is good when you obey the royal laws found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But 
If you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin, and you're guilty of breaking the law. For a person who keeps all the laws except for one is as guilty as one who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but you don't commit adultery, you've still broken the law. So whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. The Hawaiian Pigeon Translation titles this section, No make nice to some people and not to other people. Favoritism is the practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or group at the expense of another. Jesus said the second most important commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We must treat all people as we would want to be treated, not choosing some as worthy of better treatment than others based on their appearance or their wealth or their social standing or how cool we think they are. What is the Good Samaritan commended for? He's commended for taking care of one who is beaten, bloody, and naked, laying in the middle of the road. He showed mercy, and Jesus said, you go and do likewise. When we show mercy to others, the world sees the mercy of God demonstrated through us. They get to it to taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, you're giving them a taste of the mercy that God has shown us in forgiving our sins when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. At that point, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, in Christ, when we accepted him, we became that new creation. And old things passed away, and all things became new. And a believer's life should change because we're being transformed into that likeness of Christ. Consider chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a great day, stay warm, eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good is that? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Now, some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So it happened just as the scripture says. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions, not made right with God by her actions. When she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road, just as a body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. We'll be looking at this at greater detail as we continue our study, but we can clearly see the word tells us living faith will bring a change in the way we live. Unlike the demons who believe there is one God, but do not love God or submit to his lordship, With obedience, we begin to live differently, knowing we have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us, and that the life we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. Living in a way that glorifies God proves the faith behind the good works. The works do not earn us merit with God, He's not going to treat you better today because you were really good to your husband or you didn't get impatient with your children. We don't earn merit with God. We don't earn our way to heaven. But our changed life and our good works 
demonstrate that new life that we have in Christ. His spirit is at work in us, conforming us to his image. If you're a believer, then as you look at your life, since you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should see a difference between your life then and your life now. Not that we're there. We haven't arrived. Paul says, I press on toward the goal. There's always room for growth. None of us ever gets there. We're never going to be perfect. But there should be perfection happening, a process toward that perfection. One area that shows the change giving our life to Jesus has made is how we speak. Oh, my. Chapter 3. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. See, there you go. We all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes great speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, as we in California well know. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come, pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw water from a salty spring. In radiology, contrast helps highlight the difference between various types of tissues in the image. In these verses, James highlights the the contrast between the wisdom, the impact of our lives of earthly wisdom it can have on us versus God's wisdom. So when you look at an x-ray, you're looking to see a difference. This is kind of like the difference that earthly wisdom makes. I'll hold it up, you guys. So you can see if you're using earthly wisdom, people aren't really going to see a big difference between you and the world, are they? So what you want to be doing is using godly wisdom. When you're using that godly wisdom, you're going to stand out against the darkness of the world. They're going to see that. They're going to see the reality of Christ in you. Our inward heart attitude impacts our outward visible behavior. Romans 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to god the world is hostile to god for it does not submit to god's law indeed it cannot those who live in the flesh cannot please god well james in chapter four addresses this very issue what is causing the quarrels and fights among you Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. 
Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Our sin nature conflicts with the godly desires that the presence of the Holy Spirit brings. What hope is there? Verse 6, And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up in honor. Our hope is in the Lord. He gives us even more grace to stand against evil desires. By his grace, we're enabled to draw near to God. Watchman Nee says, whether we've had a good day or a bad day, whether we've consciously sinned or not, our basis of approach to God is always the same, the blood of Christ. God's acceptance of the blood is the ground upon which we may enter and there is no other. What assurance, you guys. Doesn't that make you have confidence in the Lord because you can approach his throne of grace with boldness and find the mercy and find the grace in time of need. It's not because I deserve it. It's because what Jesus did for me. It's because I'm covered in his blood. I can go to the Father at any time, no matter what's going on in my life. Then we're able to have our sins forgiven. That's the humble yourself. You're coming for forgiveness. You're coming in repentance. Your heart's going to be purified. You're going to grieve for your sin. You're going to repent. But then you're going to be lifted up by the Lord. It's not a continual state of grieving. God doesn't want us to go around in sackcloth and ashes all the time. But It's for those times when the Lord brings conviction and you know there's something in your life you need to get right. Then we don't want to just pass it off lightly and just say, oh, well, I'm not as bad as Susie Lou. You know, we want to take it seriously. Now, considering that, knowing our own struggles with sin, how we fight, who are we to pass judgment on our fellow believers when they fall short? Verse 11. Don't speak evil against each other's brothers, against each other, brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge when it applies to you and others. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? You see, our future... If we, sorry, if we speak evil of others, there goes that tongue again. We are no longer humble before the Lord. And instead, we're actually putting ourselves in his place as the judge of his law where we have no right to be. And that's not the only way we may fail to recognize God's sovereignty. In verse 13, look here, you who say, and they said this was a common thing. That's why James was addressing it. It was said by a lot of them. Today or tomorrow, we will go to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Our future is in God's plan, in his hands. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. For us to make plans is not wrong, but to assume that I'm in control of my life and that it's all going to come about exactly as I determine shows an arrogant lack of submission to the Lord as well as a very faulty view of reality. We have no idea what may occur from one day to the next, true? In October... 2019, my husband and I celebrated our 40th anniversary with a trip to a beautiful garden in Canada. And it was maybe the Garden of Eden. I guess it's nothing like the Garden of Eden, but it was gorgeous. 
Well, you know what? Little did we or anyone else know that a few short months later, that garden would be closed to everyone and nobody would be going in there for months due to a worldwide pandemic. Did fast food restaurants realize a few short weeks ago that they weren't going to be able to get lettuce for our burgers? I think not. Only God knows what lies ahead. Psalm 31, 15, my times are in your hand, is also translated, the course of my life is in your power. As we have given him our lives, we acknowledge his right to use them for his glory, no matter where that course may lead. That we may say with Paul, for I hope and trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, no matter I, whether I live or die. For those, though, who live for themselves rather than for the Lord, there will be judgment. Chapter 5. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine cloths are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Do you see in these verses any trace of hearts seeking to glorify God? Or would they be this type of non-diagnostic x-ray? Nothing. Nothing there. No resemblance. Not at all. Are they even believers? We're going to find out. Stay tuned. Unlike those who are living solely for what this world has to offer are those who are looking for the Lord's return. Verse 7. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't crumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. The Lord hears. He hears, just like the mom hears the kids in the other room. She knows what's going on. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so you will not sin and be condemned. As we mature in our faith, we learn to wait patiently through the hardships and heartaches, knowing the Lord will one day right all the wrongs. James offers us the examples of the farmer, the prophet, and Job to encourage us to keep our eyes fixed on him, to endure our trials with expectant hope. When a believer meets difficulties with faith, it's evident to those around them there's something very real in their relationship with God. And I could point out a bunch of people here, but I'm not going to. But you show that. You show that. Something they see in us that's making a difference, that stands out in contrast to those who have no hope beyond the daily circumstances of their everyday life. Because we are born again of the Spirit, we begin more and more to experience life in a dimension beyond what's seen with our eyes. We see the interaction of the physical and the spiritual, the temporal and the eternal. Verse 13. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 
Elijah was human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings a sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. In these verses, we once again hear the emphasis of faith in action. I have to tell you, I've never been able to see if someone has Jesus in their heart by looking at an x-ray. But I have very much seen in my patients that they do have Jesus in their heart by their attitudes, words, and actions. We're going to work through this book verse by verse, examining our lives in the light of God's word. When we do, we must continually bear in mind that blessing will come not when we merely do our Bible study, but when we do what the scripture commands. Christian growth doesn't just happen. Maturity is something we have to work at. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Paul's prayer that we covered just a few short weeks ago in 2 Thessalonians seems especially applicable as we begin to work through James. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the work that you want to do in us. Thank you that you love us, that you want to do more. You want us to be yielded to you. You want us to take on the image of Jesus. Father, I pray in the weeks ahead that we would open our hearts, that we'd open our ears, that we'd welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray you would not allow um, people to feel condemned, by that the enemy would not have a foothold in that, but that they would realize you show us those areas where we're in error, where we sin, that we need to repent because you want us to be closer to you, because you want us to glorify you, because you want the best for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless these women in their group, that they would be an encouragement to one another and build one another up. In Jesus' name, amen.